Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's event, which is titled, How Estrogen Influences Respiratory Function and Spinal Respiratory Neuroplasticity. We've got Dr. Brendan Doherty here with us today, who is an assistant professor in both the Division of Physical Therapy and the Division of Rehabilitation Science at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Doherty will be discussing how sex hormones influence respiratory function and neuroplasticity in rodent models. And with that, I'm very pleased to hand things off to Brendan Doherty. Uh, Brendan, thanks so much for joining us today, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Liam, and I appreciate that introduction. This is a, uh, it's a really great honor for us. We wanted to start by thanking Data Sciences International and Harvard Bioscience for the invitation to present here today and also to Liam and his team at Inside Scientific for providing this uh, first-class platform for our virtual presentation. Also want to start by thanking our funding sources. Our research is supported by grants from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, with ongoing support from the University of Minnesota's Division of Physical Therapy. So as Liam mentioned in the introduction, the, the primary goal of our research is to understand how sex hormones influence the development of neuroplasticity. By simple definition, neuroplasticity is just the, is the persistent change in the output of a neural system in response to a stimulus or experience. We can illustrate neuroplasticity with a, a simple schematic like you see at the top of the slide, where you have some baseline neural output. Then a stimulus is provided to the system, and in this case, the neural output in response to that stimulus increases. Then as a direct result of this stimulus, there is some sort of change within that neural network that produces a lasting increase, in this case, in the neural output of the system after that stimulus is removed. Now, these changes that occur as a direct result of the stimulus could be anatomical. You could have new neural connections being formed as a result of the stimulus. It could be functional, where existing neural connections are being strengthened. But regardless, there is a, a change that occurs as a direct result of that stimulus that produces a change in output. Now, this characteristic of the central nervous system, the ability to adapt in response to a stimulus is incredibly important. I have the, the honor of teaching doctor of physical therapy students here at the University of Minnesota. And when I talk about neuroplasticity, I talk about it being really the reason why neural rehabilitation strategies work. So for example, an individual can show up to a physical therapy clinic after let's say a spinal cord injury where multiple neural networks in the spinal cord have been uh, affected. And that individual in essence has a new baseline in their neural activity. Then the physical therapist is tasked with providing specific uh, respiratory procedures or, or treatments that are designed to, to engage mechanisms of neuroplasticity. The idea is to strengthen the neural connections that remain after that injury. And hopefully by, by strengthening those connections, we get improvements in neural output and uh, subsequent functional recovery. So the more that we can understand about the mechanisms of neuroplasticity, the more optimized those therapeutic interventions will be. So our laboratory utilizes the respiratory motor system as a model to study neuroplasticity, and, and this system has some distinct advantages. For example, breathing is an automatic motor behavior. It doesn't require any additional training. Our rats show up in our lab and they are already breathing. So you have this really nice rhythmic motor output that is occurring all the time. That respiratory rhythm is generated by collections of rhythmically active cells in the brainstem, specifically in the medulla and the pons. And those respiratory signals are then transmitted through groups of premotor neurons and eventually to primary motor neurons, both in the brainstem and the spinal cord that connect to respiratory muscles. Today, we're gonna to focus mostly on the phrenic motor system. Phrenic motor neurons are a column of motor neurons that reside in the ventral horn of the upper cervical spinal cord between the third and the fifth level. This is the same for rats and for humans. 
The axons of these motor neurons will leave the spinal cord, will come together to form the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve will innervate the diaphragm, which is our primary muscle of breathing. Now we take advantage of this neural network in an in vivo experimental preparation to uh, record the respiratory neural activity. So in mostly young adult rats, the rats are anesthetized, mechanically ventilated, and vagotomized. And then we are able to use a dorsal approach to dissect out the phrenic nerve. You can see on the schematic on the left, we have again a basic illustration of the respiratory network where, where brainstem neural signals are, are sent down to phrenic motor neurons in the spinal cord. Those would be your red ovals. And then uh, the axons will come together to the phrenic nerve. We can dissect out the phrenic nerve, we can cut it distally, and we can uh, lay that nerve over some recording electrodes. And what we get is a, a raw signal like you see here in the middle. Now the arrow is, is referring to one of those phrenic bursts. Those phrenic bursts represent compound action potentials that are going through the phrenic nerve on a moment to moment basis. Now, what we're looking at here then is basically the the, the neural representation of breathing, okay? So each of these bursts would cause a subsequent contraction of the diaphragm and the initiation of an inspiratory breath, okay? So this, I like to think about this as the language that the brain is using to tell the diaphragm what to do. Unfortunately, in this form, this language is a little bit difficult to, to quantify. So we need to, to translate it into a more usable form. And so, we can rectify those raw signals and use a mathematical uh, integration technique. And what we're left with is a positive waveform pattern that you see on the right that we call fictive breaths. Fictive is fictional because um, the, under normal circumstances, those neural signals would be activating the diaphragm, but because our nerve has been disconnected from the diaphragm in this controlled situation, um, it will not cause contractions. But What's nice is that the, the amplitude of those fictive breath signals, those integrated nerve amplitude, tells us information that is uh, behaviorally relevant. So the amplitude or the height of those signals corresponds to tidal volume, which is the amount of air that the rat would be bringing in with each breath if it was awake and moving around. Now, because we use a dorsal approach for this surgical procedure, we also have access to the spinal cord. And I'll just mention here that having access to the spinal cord allows us to utilize an intrathecal catheter to uh, target drug delivery to the area of phrenic motor neurons. And this is one of the primary ways that has been utilized to decipher mechanisms of respiratory neuroplasticity. So we have this system, uh, this way of measuring neural output of the respiratory system, and now we need a way to induce neuroplasticity. So what I'm showing here on the bottom, again, is some examples of our integrated phrenic bursts, okay? This would be under baseline conditions. And then what we have done is we have compressed those phrenic bursts so that I can show you a full experimental paradigm. So this is about three to four hours of recording. So we have our baseline conditions, our amplitude of those integrated phrenic bursts that is indicated by the yellow dashed line. But to induce neuroplasticity, we need a stimulus. So in this case, we use a stimulus called acute intermittent hypoxia. Hypoxia is reduced oxygen. So we can, you know, just for an example, as you're sitting here listening to me, you are breathing room air, which is approximately 21% oxygen. If we reduce the level of oxygen in our experimental preparation down to, let's say, 10% to 12% oxygen, the body is going to sense uh, that those changes in, in oxygen levels. It's going to tell the brain, hey, we need to breathe harder. And that is reflected by a larger amplitude in our phrenic burst signal. So we decrease the, the oxygen level to our rats for a period of about five minutes. Then we cycle back to baseline conditions and we repeat this three times. And this acute intermittent hypoxia is our stimulus by which neuroplasticity is induced. After the third hypoxic episode, we return the rat to baseline conditions and we record the neural output of the phrenic nerve for a period of 60 to 90 minutes. And as you can see in the example here, there is a progressive increase in the amplitude of that phrenic nerve signal over time. 
the difference, as noted by that red line on the right-hand side, between baseline amplitude and the amplitude after, let's say, 60 minutes, is an indicator of the magnitude of neuroplasticity in this system. And this happens to have a specific name. This is called long-term facilitation. And because we're recording from the phrenic nerve, this is called phrenic long-term facilitation. Now, phrenic long-term facilitation is a model of neuroplasticity that's been studied for uh, quite a while now. Uh, this is not a new thing. In fact, we know quite a bit about the mechanisms by which this form of neuroplasticity develops. What you're looking at here is a, an image taken from a review paper in 2018 by Sarah Turner and colleagues down at the University of Florida. And what it shows are the, are the known mechanisms, or the known mechanisms at that point anyway, that lead to phrenic long-term facilitation. And so this is kind of a lot, a lot going on in this slide, but I'll, turn, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the left side of this figure because the pathway I'm about to describe is the one that corresponds to the example I gave in the previous slide, where we're reducing levels of oxygen to 10 to 12% during our intermittent hypoxia stimulus. Those, though, that, that reduction in oxygen causes the release of serotonin, uh, a neuromodulator, into the spinal cord, including to the area around our phrenic motor neurons. That episodic release of serotonin causes activation of serotonin receptors on phrenic motor neurons. These serotonin receptors happen to be GQ-coupled protein receptors, and hence this pathway is known as the Q pathway. After activation of serotonin receptors, you have downstream signaling through ERK-MAP kinase, the new translation and release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, activation of the high-affinity BDNF receptor TREK-B, and downstream signaling through PKC isoforms. Ultimately, at the end, you have some sort of potentiation of glutamate receptors. We believe that this potentiation of glutamate receptors is what leads to that progressive increase in neural output with uh, following the removal of the hypoxic stimulus. Now, as you can see, there's a whole other pathway on this slide, the S pathway. The S pathway is a, a dominant pathway to phrenic long-term facilitation if we're using a more severe hypoxic stimulus. So for example, instead of using 10% to 12% hypoxia, we reduced it down to six to 9% hypoxia then we can induce phrenic long-term facilitation via this primarily adenosine-dependent and GS-coupled protein receptor pathway. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the S pathway, and you can see that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of, of crosstalk between these two pathways, and, and that work uh, about deciphering all of this, these interactions is being done by the lab of Gordon Mitchell down at the University of Florida right now. But Primarily, what I wanted to point out is each step of these pathways is identified by a red number, which is a reference to a, a study that was done to, um, to, to discover its place in the pathway. So there's been a tremendous amount of work done to figure out all of these mechanisms over the past three decades. But it's important to, to note that all of the studies that are represented here were done in young adult male rats. And so there was a question over a period of time about whether the same mechanisms would be occurring in females or even whether acute intermittent hypoxia as a stimulus could induce this form of respiratory neuroplasticity in female rats. So there was a study done back in 2001 by Andrea Zopka, who was a graduate student with Mary Behan and Gordon Mitchell at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And this was the first study to utilize female rats in a study of phrenic long-term facilitation. In this study, they used uh, female rats in two stages of the estrus cycle, um, young adult rats, and compared them to middle-aged rats, about 13 months of age. And I wanted to take one statement from the discussion of this paper that demonstrates, uh, as a result of the, of, the, of the findings in this paper, the author said that young adult female rats in estrus and diestrus did not show significant LTF at any time point post episodic hypoxia. And reading this statement, uh, one might uh, come to the conclusion, I know I did, that young female rats actually may not express respiratory neuroplasticity in response to intermittent hypoxia. 
But also embedded in this statement is one of the key points and one of primary, primarily one of the reasons why people don't um, study female, uh, female rats um, more regularly. And that is that female rats have a, a very, very um, significant and rapid fluctuation in circulating sex hormones that could have substantial impact on their physiology. So let's talk about the estrus cycle for a second. This is an image that was uh, taken from a, a paper from Staley and Scharfman in 2005, and I've simplified it just to highlight estrogen and progesterone, which are two of the, the more recognized uh, sex hormones in females. Um, the estrus cycle in rodents is um, similar to the female menstrual cycle in humans. And you can see that across both of these cycles, there is uh, pretty significant fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone. Now, uh, the pattern of this fluctuation is relatively similar between rats and humans, but it's important to note that the human menstrual cycle is stretched over 28 days, whereas the rat estrus cycle occurs every four days. So that means a complete rat estrus cycle occurs every four days. This four day cycle in rats is separated into four distinct uh, periods. We have estrus, we have diestrus, or um, uh, what some will call met estrus as well. Then we have a second diestrus period and proestrus. Now in the study that I just shared from Zapka and colleagues, they studied young adult female rats both in diestrus and in estrus, okay? And female rats did not express plasticity in either of these two time points. But one of the things that I became interested in is the fact that in both diestrus and estrus, you have relatively modest to low levels of circulating estrogen, which is the primary neuroactive steroid in females. I was wondering if we caught the rats on the morning of proestrus, which is where the peak of circulating estrogen occurs in female rats, whether there would be a difference in their capacity to express long-term facilitation. So while I was working in the laboratory of Dr. Jyoti Waters at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, we put together a study to explore this. We had groups of rats uh, in estrus and in proestrus stages of the estrus cycle, and we measured their expression of LTF. And so again, what we're looking at here, this is a representation of our um, integrated phrenic nerve signals on the left-hand side. The amplitude of those signals at baseline is represented by the white dotted line. And then we went through the intermittent hypoxia protocol that I previously described, and rats in the estrus phase of the estrus cycle, again, showed no phrenic long-term facilitation. So this uh, is repeated and confirmed the findings of Zopka and colleagues that young adult female rats in this stage of the estrus cycle did not express phrenic long-term facilitation. However, when we were able to catch female rats on the morning of proestrus, that is notable for high levels of circulating estrogen, these female rats did indeed express phrenic long-term facilitation. So then the next step we thought to ourselves was, okay, if, if high levels of circulating estrogen are necessary to enable neuroplasticity in females, then what would happen if we were removed the primary source of, of estrogen? So in, in females, the ovaries are the primary source of circulating estrogen, and removing the ovaries is a procedure called ovariectomy. Now we hypothesized that ovariectomizing young female rats would cause a loss of phrenic long-term facilitation. Now I realize this is not much of a stretch, right? I mean, we've already shown that during both diestrus and estrus, which are notable for low levels of circulating estrogen, that um, rats did not express plasticity. And so we were pretty confident that removing the ovaries would also um, uh, prevent us from inducing this form of plasticity. And in fact, that was the case. When we tested rats seven days after removal of the ovaries, there was uh, no expression of long-term facilitation after acute intermittent hypoxia. So then we reasoned that if estrogen specifically was the hormone that was important to enable this form of neuroplasticity, 
then if we gave uh, the estrogen back to the female rats after ovariectomy, then we should be able to rescue this form of neuroplasticity. And in fact, that was indeed the case. So what you're looking at here is our combined data from this paper. And if I uh, point your attention to the, the dark bar on the right hand side, this is our group of ovariectomized female rats. These rats received a single dose of estradiol benzoate IP about three hours prior to our neurophysiology experiment. Now the goal was to return circulating levels of estradiol to the levels that were similar to what you would see during proestrus in uh, an intact female. So we wanted these to be physiologically normal levels of estradiol. And when we did that, we were able to restore neuroplasticity sim to similar levels as what we saw in females during proestrus. These were both highly significantly different from rats during estrus or rats that were ovariectomized. So the takeaway here from these groups of studies was that phrenic long-term facilitation of a form of inducible neuroplasticity was expressed only during the proestrous stage of the estrus cycle, which is notable for high levels of circulating estrogen. Removal of the ovaries and subsequent reduction in estrogen levels per, uh, impaired our ability to induce this phrenic long-term facilitation. This study showed that that occurred after one week we also have a paper that's currently in review that demonstrates that this effect of ovariectomy lasts for up to 12 weeks. We also showed that PLTF is restored following ovariectomy with estrogen supplementation, providing evidence that estrogen is likely uh, the, the primary hormone that is necessary to enable expression of uh, this form of plasticity. So then the next question we asked is, if estrogen is so important for expression of this form of plasticity in females, is estrogen also necessary for expression of this form of plasticity in males? Before we go into the initial studies that looked at this, I wanted to take a step back and, demonst and to talk a little bit about how these sex steroids are derived. So this is a, a figure that was taken from a, a review paper by Christina Diani down at the University of Alabama, Birmingham and colleagues from 2020. And it's a really nice representation of the pathway to, um, to these primary sex hormones. So all of our sex hormones are derived from cholesterol and through a series of enzymatic steps, uh, that cholesterol is broken down into our primary sex hormones. Um, we can get down to testosterone here because testosterone is the primary circulating sex hormone in males. Testosterone can act in the central nervous system via uh, androgen receptors, or testosterone can be further broken down in two different directions. It can be broken down through an enzyme into dihydrotestosterone, which we can, um, uh, which we can um, shorten to DHT. DHT is a very potent form of testosterone, also acting through androgen receptors in the central nervous system. Also, you will notice that testosterone, if you go to the right on this figure, can be converted to 17-beta estradiol. 17-beta estradiol is the most neuroactive form of estrogen. So testosterone can be converted to estrogen through the P45 aromatase enzyme or simply aromatase. Now, if you give a drug that blocks the activity of aromatase, you can block the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, which is a useful tool to use in these particular studies. It's also important to note that once testosterone has been converted to DHT, DHT is not able to be converted to estrogen, right? So with this knowledge in mind, I'll review the first paper that asked the question about whether estrogen is necessary in male rats to express acute intermittent hypoxia induced neuroplasticity. This is again a paper from Zopka and colleagues from 2006. And in this paper, they demonstrated that young adult male rats expressed normal phrenic long-term facilitation. That is the, the two circles on the, uh, in the middle of this uh, graph data graph here, so at 60 minutes. Okay. Then they reasoned that if they removed the testicles, which are the primary source of circulating sex hormone in males, if they castrated these male rats, then those male rats would lose the capacity to express LTF. 
The gonad ectomized or castrated male rats are in the filled triangles, which are mostly obscured by other group data in this image, but uh, the results were that they did indeed eliminate phrenic long-term facilitation in gonad ectomized male rats. They then, just like the study that we just described, they then supplemented these male rats with testosterone. And not only did testosterone supplementation restore plasticity in these male rats, but it was slightly enhanced. But then the authors were left with a little bit of a, uh, a tricky interpretation because we just mentioned that testosterone can work on its own or it can be converted to estradiol. So they took the extra step to try to see whether or not it was the testosterone that was important for plasticity or whether it was the estrogen that testosterone was converted into that was important. And so in this case, what they did is they gave testosterone supplements with the addition of ADT. And ADT is an aromatase inhibitor, which prevents the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And when they gave these two together in the dark squares, they eliminated the expression of phrenic long-term facilitation. In addition, if they supplemented rats with DHT instead of regular testosterone, they were also unable to restore neuroplasticity in the castrated male rats. So together, what this uh, report demonstrated was that removal of the gonads prevented acute intermittent hypoxia-induced plasticity, and that testosterone supplementation is sufficient to restore LTF, but only when it's converted to estrogen. Now, I, I, I made a point to say sufficient here because it is yet to be demonstrated that this testosterone to estrogen conversion is necessary in gonadally intact male rats. But one of my graduate students, Jessica Grittner, is currently just about finished with data collection on a group of studies that is looking at that specific question where we are giving an aromatase inhibitor to intact male rats to determine whether or not that conversion of testosterone to estradiol is necessary in male rats for the expression of long-term facilitation. So again, overall summary, estrogen appears to be very important in this process and um, in both males and females. Uh, in males, it seems to be that testosterone uh, supplementation for example, can restore neuroplasticity following removal of the gonads, but only if converted to estrogen. So then the next question is going to be, well, how does this work? Like what are the mechanisms by which estrogen is, is working to enable neuroplasticity? And so again, I gotta take a step back and talk generally about how estrogen signals in the central nervous system. Again, this is another image taken from that review paper by Deany and colleagues back in 2020. It's a great overview of, of central nervous system modes of action of, of estradiol. So generally there's two modes of action of estrogen. We're gonna talk first about the classical mode of action on the right hand side. Estrogen itself is a very small lipophilic molecule, it freely passes through blood brain barrier, it crosses the plasma membrane of cells, it can get in into the nucleus freely. And so you have this free estradiol uh, that's circulating around uh, neurons, for example, it will cross through the plasma membrane where it will interact with uh, estrogen receptors in the cytoplasm. This complex will then be transmitted to the, to the nucleus where it participates in transcription of new genes and eventually new protein development. However, this classical mode of action is generally described as being slow acting, like on the order of, of days and weeks, uh, and producing long lasting effects on, on biology. There's another mode of action on the left hand side that's considered the non classical mode of action, and this is a more recent development, uh, comparatively speaking. Here they've discovered that estrogen receptors can be embedded into the plasma membrane. Therefore, estrogen can can bind specifically to these membrane associated estrogen receptors and cause downstream signaling effects that will ultimately lead to rapid modulation, synaptic function and behavioral modifications. Now we have some initial evidence that it is indeed this fast acting non-classical mode of action that is involved with phrenic long-term facilitation. 
in that paper that we described earlier, we also looked at a group of ovariectomized female rats and then utilizing the fact that we could give intrathecal injections uh, to the vicinity of phrenic motor neurons, we injected estrogen that was bound to bovine serum albumin. And this E2 BSA complex becomes too large to pass through the plasma membrane. And so the idea here is that if this form of estrogen causes an effect, then the effect is likely because that estrogen is being uh, bound to estrogen receptors on the plasma membrane that have access to the extracellular space. When we injected E2 BSA intrathecally just 15 minutes prior to our acute intermittent hypoxia stimulus, we were able to restore phrenic long-term facilitation in ovariectomized rats. This suggests that these membrane-bound estrogen receptors are uh, likely involved in this process. And because these membrane estrogen receptors have fast acting uh, pathways that could interact with the known mechanisms of, of uh, LTF, we have a number of different targets to look at. So if we go back to our, our description of, this, of the known mechanisms of neuroplasticity, we have a whole bunch of, of targets that have been previously described in other parts of the central nervous system that could be directly impacted by estrogen signaling. So for example, right at the top of the Q pathway, estrogen has been identified to work presynaptically to potentially affect uh, serotonin release. It can also work postsynaptically to modify serotonin receptors. And so our estrogen or the presence of estrogen could be working directly at that level to um, uh, affect these downstream pathways. But as you can see, there's a number of different targets uh, that we need to shoot for, which is a little bit daunting, but also very exciting. Now we're going to change directions just real briefly because um, my clinical back background as a physical therapist generally means that I approach these studies in a way where I'm always thinking about how they eventually will uh, be applicable to humans. And so one of the ways that we do this is to determine whether or not the findings that we do, that we collect in this somewhat reduced neurophysiological preparation could also apply to behavior. And so we're very fortunate to have an excellent working relationship with Data Sciences International that happens to be headquartered about 10 miles from my lab. Um, to set up a, a real state-of-the-art barometric plethysmography system uh, here uh, in our laboratory. Now, barometric plethysmography is a, is a way that we are able to measure overall breathing function in awake, unanesthetized, freely behaving rats. Okay? Barometric plethysmography is also uh, utilized in humans, and so there is some clinical correlation there. Generally, what will happen is rats are placed in this plexiglass chamber, we can control the bias flow of air that goes through that chamber, which prevents buildup of carbon dioxide and allows us to manipulate the, the air in which those rats are breathing. The rats are generally curious. They go in, they sniff around for a while, then they kind of curl up and relax. And when they come to that relaxed state of breathing, changes of, in pressure within that uh, chamber can be calibrated to flow traces similar to what you see here. In this signal, that downward deflection there represents the inspiratory phase of breathing. That upward deflection is the expiratory phase. And then you have that long plateau between breaths, which is just the space between breaths. You can tell by the small amplitude and the, and the distance between breaths that this is a baseline breathing. This is just a quiet breathing trace from our rats. However, we can utilize this particular uh, system to look at the induction of neuroplasticity on a more systems level, okay? So for example, we have our baseline output, which is the, the trace that I just showed you in the previous slide. But then we can stimulate this rat very similar to what we do on our phrenic nerve stimulations by, produce, by, by doing intermittent hypoxic stimulation where we reduce the uh, level of oxygen that's going into the chamber down to between 10 and 12%. This is a study that we published in 2019 where we used five episodes of hypoxia, each five minutes in duration, separated by five minutes of room air breathing. And then we looked at overall breathing function 60 minutes afterwards. And so if you compare the baseline flow trace on the left-hand side on the bottom to what happened 60 minutes after this intermittent hypoxic stimulus, 
you can appreciate that the amplitude of that signal has increased. Now, if we can show an increase in amplitude of this signal, what we're looking at is an increase in, in, in ventilation. And this in turn is another form of long-term facilitation called ventilatory long-term facilitation. So as a, a first proof of concept study with ventilatory long-term facilitation, we studied female rats, intact young adult female rats at different stages of the estrus cycle. And we demonstrated that ventilatory long-term facilitation, again, in awake, unanesthetized rats, only occurs during the pro-estrous stage of the estrous cycle, notable for high levels of circulating estrogen. Okay, this is reflected in minute ventilation, which is the combination, which is really a measure of overall breathing function. Also, um, minute ventilation is com comprised of, of taking respiratory frequency and, and multiplying it by tidal volume, or the, the magnitude of, of their breaths. And we also were able to show that this uh, form of plasticity was really being facilitated by the rats taking deeper breaths or improving tidal volume. Now, again, this corresponds very nicely to what we showed in our phrenic nerve studies, where the amplitude of our phrenic nerve signal corresponded to tidal volume. Here we have confirmed that in a behavioral test demonstrating that um, behavioral neuroplasticity occurs in females only during pro-estrus. So we look forward to uh, utilizing the barometric plethysmography system in subsequent studies to again, link our, our neural findings with uh, our behavioral findings. So to conclude, again, our, our laboratory is primarily interested in defining how sex hormones influence respiratory function and the development of respiratory neuroplasticity and we're using preclinical model, rodent models do it. All of the test, uh, all of the studies I've shown you now are, are sort of our, our baseline tests. They are fundamental um, biological examples of how sex hormones might influence respiratory function and neuroplasticity, but eventually we want to apply those to um, models of, of disease and, and overall health. So, I, I draw this schematic to demonstrate sort of the three pillars of, of where our lab is heading. Changes in looking at sex hormones and uh, how sex hormones influence plasticity lends itself very obviously to aging studies. We have collaborations with uh, Dr. Don Lau here at the University of Minnesota who looks at estrogen receptor signaling in skeletal muscle in aging models and with the gradual changes in um, sex hormone production in both males and females with aging, it's important for us to understand how those natural processes will occur, will um, affect our ability to induce neuroplasticity. We also are interested in um, adiposity and obesity. I have another uh, graduate student, Dr. Uh, Rebecca Fetzer, who is developing a, a model of, of rodent obesity that mimics the uh, hormone profile changes that are seen in humans that have um, obesity or increased adiposity. And we want to determine whether or not those changes in, in hormones as a result of increased adiposity uh, affect our ability to, inf to induce neuroplasticity. And then again, as I, uh, as I may have mentioned earlier in an example, we also uh, have a number of spinal cord injury studies going on right now. Traumatic spinal cord injury um, in humans causes a, uh, a change in, in hormone levels that can last um, uh, various lengths of time, but up to the rest of the life of the individual. And so we want to understand how those changes in sex hormones as a result of traumatic spinal cord injury could influence our ability to induce neuroplasticity for the purposes of improving motor function. So with that, I'd like to conclude saying thank you to everyone for tuning in. Again, thank you to all of the sponsors of this event for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan, for a really fantastic presentation. And with that, we're going to move right on to the Q&A. Okay, so first question today comes from Noah, who's asked, does phrenic LTF uh, occur with other respiratory stimuli like hypercapnia, or is it specific to hypoxia? Um, 
Yes, thank you for that question. So, so um, levels of carbon dioxide are, are very important um, to the magnitude of phrenic long-term facilitation, but intermittent hypercapnia specifically does not induce the same uh, downstream mechanisms that lead to phrenic long-term facilitation. In fact, previous studies have shown that uh, repetitive hypercapnia actually causes a, a, a depression in, in the long-term uh, long -term depression of phrenic motor output. But the, inter the interaction between hypercapnia and hypoxia is an area of, of ongoing study. I think that likely there's going to be uh, a range of, of hypercapnic values or hypercapnic levels that will be necessary to maximize this particular form of, of neuroplasticity. But if you're just looking at it sort of in, in, a, in a box here, intermittent hypercapnia does not induce the same uh, plasticity as intermittent hypoxia. It really is a hypoxia-specific uh, phenomenon. Excellent. Uh, great answer. Next question comes from uh, Marissa. Great question here. Do you think the use of birth control in humans could change the capacity to express LTF since birth control changes the estrogen progesterone relationship? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and again, this is when we're thinking long term about potential ways that these findings could apply to humans. That's definitely something that we have in our minds. I think it's it's very premature at this point based on what we know about how estrogen is involved in this particular type of plasticity to make that jump. However, if we uh, continue to demonstrate that, that estrogen levels are important, uh, uh, an important prerequisite to, to um, uh, inducing this type of, of, of neuroplasticity, then any drug really that's gonna cause changes in the balance of, of sex hormones potentially could, could influence our ability to induce plasticity. So it's definitely on our minds as we continue these studies moving forward. And at some point, um, as we begin to partner with, with um, scientists working in, in, with humans, um, that would be a question that would be of great interest for us. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we've received a number of questions about progesterone. Uh, Adriana has asked, could progesterone or other neurosteroids participate in neuroplasticity as well? Um, so do you have any evidence that progesterone uh, in particular is not the key hormone influencing plasticity? Yeah, actually I do. Um, give me a second. I have a slide actually that I can throw up. I, I didn't include it in the talk just for, for timing's sake, but um, so there, there has been indications uh, in the past that, that progesterone specifically, or even the, the ratio of progesterone to estrogen in, in females um, is important for the development of neuroplasticity. And so what we did is we were looking for, for a naturally occurring period of time where we had high levels of progesterone and low levels of circulating estradiol. And so that period is, is naturally occurring in rats in early postpartum. And so we studied a group of postpartum female rats that have this, this naturally high progesterone and low estrogen. Um, and what we, what we found was that they, um, they did not express phrenic long-term facilitation after intermittent hypoxia. So, so we, we, this was the initial evidence that we had that likely it's not progesterone specifically that is involved in the mechanisms of neuroplasticity. It's likely estrogen. But one of the things you'll notice on this particular trace is that they had incredibly large hypoxic responses. And so it, it appears that progesterone is, is uh, more important for the sensitivity to hypoxia. And that's been suggested in human studies as well. Um, but, but it doesn't appear that progesterone is directly related to mechanisms of neuroplasticity. However, we can't rule it out. And it's something that we're always, we always sort of have in the back of our minds. And, uh, should we have evidence as we move forward that progesterone plays a more direct role? It's a, it's a direction that we will, we will definitely go. All right. Fantastic. Great answer. There we go. Uh, all right. Next question comes from Alexandra, who's asked, um, do you know if your data correlates with the COVID-19 pathogenesis? Uh, 
she said some clinical studies are testing anti-androgen drugs like flutamide as therapy uh, to severe COVID, but the patient number is still very small. Yeah, I to be honest, I have um, I have I, I have no knowledge of specifically how the pathways that I've just described to you interact with the known mechanisms of the COVID nineteen outbreak. Um, we've done some initial studies looking at. Uh, some thoughts we have related to COVID-19 here at the U University of Minnesota related to how um, it could impact the neural pathways of breathing, but, but we haven't gotten to a point where we've seen any uh, interaction specifically with, uh, with the, the sex hormone um, uh, mechanisms that I've, that I've just described. Um, I, I, because sex hormones play sort of a ubiquitous role in, in so many of the uh, physiological systems in the body. I, I don't necessarily uh, have a, a great deal of surprise that it is uh, involved in the COVID-19 response, but um, unfortunately I don't have any specific information about how the two are linked. All right, excellent. Um, question here from Colleen who says, uh, very nice talk, thank you. Uh, have you looked at exercise effects to hormone levels and neuroplasticity? Uh, we have not. Um, again, we we are are pretty focused right now on on trying to get the our baseline knowledge of of how um, estrogen signaling specifically interacts with this form of neuroplasticity. I, but I would love to partner with somebody to to look at the role that exercise would play um, in uh, again in changing hormone levels um, and and how that in turn could impact our ability to induce neuroplasticity. You know, I didn't include. Or, uh, exercise protocols on my on my triangle diagram of, of sort of the direction our lab is going, but I can very easily make that a square if somebody uh, is interested in uh, in those in that particular uh, uh, group of studies. Yeah, definitely an interesting avenue of research for the future. Um, another good question from Jay Nair, who says, in humans, it's hard to elicit ventilatory LTF in a poikilocapnic condition. How is that different mm -hmm. from VLTF in anesthetized rats? And did you use high CO2 in the inspired air to elicit the VLTF? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, you're absolutely right. In, in humans, um, it's much more difficult to, to elicit ventilatory long-term facilitation, normally it requires you to have a, a basal level of carbon dioxide stimulation on board as well. In our rat model, we did not um, include any additional carbon dioxide leaked into the system. Um, and so there is a slight difference in our ability to induce ventilatory long-term facilitation in rats uh, versus humans don't have a good explanation right now for why that is. However, in those studies, we did not um, specifically bleed in carbon dioxide. Now, having said that, the amplitude of that ventilatory long-term facilitation was relatively small, about a 20% increase above baseline. Now, our phrenic long-term facilitation studies are, are usually roughly double that amount. So they're usually in the 40 to 60% increase relative to baseline range. It's definitely possible in our rats we could get more consistent results if we used, uh, you know, you know, one to three percent carbon dioxide uh, in the system as well. Uh, we have not tried that yet in our lab, um, but I know other labs are 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 tinkering with the the protocols for ventilatory long term facilitation to try to optimize them, and um, we will happily adapt our protocols um, when those uh, when those pro when the optimized protocols become available. All right, excellent, great answer. Um, another question from uh, from Timothy here, who says it's it's similar to the first question, but how does intermittent hypoxia hypercapnia induce LTF, uh, either PLTF or VLTF, um, and is this a similar message as IH alone? Um, so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that I, that I understand the question completely, but I can, I can go back and refer to what we, what we currently know um, as the mechanisms of, of phrenic long-term facilitation um, at the cellular level. And again, it's that this, this reduction in the levels of oxygen cause 
they stimulate the the uh, RAFE neurons in the brainstem, which prim which are are the primary serotonin producing cells. And those cells have descending projections down into the spinal cord. And so as you reduce the level of oxygen, you, you increase serotonin release into the spinal cord. And it's this episodic nature of that, of that release that you get with acute intermittent hypoxia that causes this cascade of events to happen, leading to phrenic long-term facilitation. Now, if you just do a sustained uh, hypoxic stimulus, so for example, instead of doing five minutes on, five minutes off, repeating it three times, if you take that uh, time frame, that full time frame, and you just give one long hypoxic stimulation, the same um, uh, LTF is not expressed. It, it, it is definitely reliant on the pattern of stimulation. So it is this intermittent hypoxic stimulus that initiates this uh, type of plasticity. Now, this isn't really unheard of. I mean, there's lots of evidence in the in the learning literature, for example, to say that if you're if you're learning, if you're forming new memory connections, for example, intermittent uh, intermittent stimulation is going to help improve that memory formation as well, right? So it's it's not unheard of in the central nervous system for intermittent stimulus needed uh, being needed for effective induction of of neuroplasticity, and the same is the case here. Um, we believe that these same mechanisms are at play in the awake uh, animal. The difference is the, the question that Jay uh, asked a little bit earlier is that in an awake animal, we are not controlling uh, a number of the naturally occurring uh, physiological responses in our awake animal that we are when we're looking at phrenic long-term facilitation. So with our PLTF studies, we are controlling the level of carbon dioxide in the blood. We're controlling for pH, for example. We're controlling for all of these variables so that we know that the response that we're getting is specifically due to the hypoxic stimulus. When we have an awake, freely behaving animal, we do not have those same controls, okay? So as the rat uh, breathes harder in response to hypoxia, they are going to blow off more carbon dioxide. And because carbon dioxide is a primary stimulator to breathe, as they blow off more carbon dioxide, then the brain is gonna tell the rat to breathe less, okay? And so you have this negative feedback system that's occurring in your awake rats that is not present when we're doing our neurophysiological experiments. So because of that, the that's one of the primary reasons we think that the amplitude of ventilatory long-term facilitation is not nearly as high as what you get with phrenic long-term facilitation. We're just, we're not able to, to control as many of the variables in an awake animal, but it's still important for us to demonstrate that this form of plasticity can be induced in an awake animal because inducing plasticity ultimately is the goal when we translate our findings to humans. Excellent, great answer there. Um, I think we have time for maybe about two more questions. Uh, this one comes in from Harish, who's asked uh, whether you have any idea which estrogen receptors might be involved in the expression of respiratory plasti neuroplasticity. Um, so it looks like there's quite a few options. Just wondering if you had any insight which ones it might be. Yeah, so the, the Q pathway, the primary pathway, when we're talking about moderate you know, 10 to 12 percent uh, intermittent hypoxic stimulus is driven primarily by serotonin 2A and 2B receptors. Um, there is a serotonin uh, type 7 receptor as well that's been shown to be more involved in uh, the S pathway, which is, again, that pathway associated with more severe hypoxic stimuli. Um, but normally 2A and 2B are the primary receptors that are involved with uh, what we would consider normal activation of uh, AIH-induced neuroplasticity. Excellent. And I think in the interest of time, we'll make this next question the last one. Uh, Joseph has asked, how does your intermittent hypoxia stimulus compare to altitude training for athletes? <laughs> Yeah, so we get, I get this question a lot, and I, I, I get it enough where I, I really should uh, have more knowledge of the, of the specific differences. But the idea here is that 
Um, there is uh, an idea that if athletes live at low altitudes and train at high altitudes, then that that exposure to hypoxia will will have a beneficial effect on their uh, their athletic performance. Um, I think one of the primary things that you have at play here is a time issue, right? So our intermittent hypoxia stimuluses that we use are on the order of, of five minutes duration. So you can think about it going from, from sea level to, you know, a 14,000 foot ski resort uh, over about 30 seconds and then coming back down after, uh, after five minutes. Um, it's a very rapid change in the hypoxic levels. When you live low and train high, that time course is stretched out pretty significantly. And even though technically it's intermittent in that you're going up and down on a maybe a, a, an eight or a 12 hour time scale, um, the mechanisms of adaptation are going to be very different. And I think a lot of the effects that you get with altitude training are probably related more to how your body reacts or responds to to changes in oxygen. So it's going to be more on the on the sensory side of things versus the motor output side of things. Um, but having said that, again, I, I, I there probably is some crossover between the mechanisms of those two, um, but uh, they are they are very very different. And the one that we're talking about with acute intermittent hy hypoxia is very specific. Brilliant. Well, uh, thanks so much, Brennan, for the really fantastic presentation and also your nice insights in the Q&A today. Thank you very much, Liam, and uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in. Definitely. Big thanks to the audience for joining us today. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I'd also like to thank Harvard Bioscience for sponsoring this event to make it possible. Uh, so in closing, thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and I look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.